Well, good afternoon. I'm Charles Overby. I'm the CEO of the Museum and the Freedom Forum, and I'm just delighted to be on campus for this first program of our fall series, and I'm delighted to welcome each of you here. Thank you for coming. Um, we are building a tradition of uh, programs on the Thursday or the Friday before home football games. There's nothing magic about that, except that here we are right at the Grove, and uh, assuming that as football season progresses, you can actually make your way through the early uh, entries on the Grove, uh, we hope to uh, be able to um, educate you and entertain you and inform you with programs that uh, Curtis Wilkie and I think are going to be pretty interesting. Uh, I said when I looked at the series of programs that Curtis put together, that it just couldn't get any better than this, that the programs ranged from uh, Elvis to politics to Mississippi women. And there's just nothing better than that. So uh, I hope that you will join us uh, each week before the home football games to have a little fun, maybe uh, see some programs that will be provo provocative and informative. Uh, today's program is uh, a little bit different from uh, what we've done in the past. We have a little experience about an Elvis program uh, up in Washington at our museum. We, um, a few months ago, uh, opened an exhibit about Elvis. Uh, he would have been 75 if he had lived or if he's still alive. We're really not sure. <laughs> <laughs> he's left the building. <laughs> he left the building. Well, he left the building and he's in the museum now, and it's been, a, it's been a while since I've seen anything that appealed to so many different generations. Older people enjoy it, uh, middle-aged people enjoy it, and young people, surprisingly, are uh, transfixed by it. And so we thought it would be fun to gather here today and uh, talk about that day that Elvis died. The uh, major domo around here, not just of the Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics, but on campus as the resident guru who knows a little bit about a lot of things and a lot about a few things, is Curtis Wilkie. He's the uh, inaugural senior fellow of the Overby Center. Nobody ever again will be the inaugural senior fellow. <laughs> there will be others perhaps to follow him, but they will not be inaugural. And it is not an accident that we chose Curtis to be the inaugural fellow because, as I've said so many times, he is synonymous with Southern journalism and politics. And he honors us, I think the campus and the state of Mississippi, by doing what he does so well. And so on that note, I'm glad to turn the program over to Curtis Wilkie. Thank you, Charles. Uh, feeling kind of senior today, uh, anyway. Um, and we're always glad to get you here at uh, the Overby Center. Uh, looks like, from what I can see of the crowd, that a lot of us remember that day. Uh, everybody remember where they were when they got word that Elvis had died? Uh, I, I remember. <laughs> anyway, we have three people who really remember. Uh, where they were the day that Elvis died, and I think we'll have a lot of fun with uh, this panel. Let me just briefly introduce them to you and turn it over to them. Uh, let them tell all the tales they want to, anything goes. Uh, let me start off. We have two, two of the members of the panel are native Memphians, and the others just down the road, uh, down Highway 61 or 49, 61, uh, in Mississippi Delta. So um, anyway, uh, first here is Susan Bennett, who uh, is a native of Memphis, and, and she reminded me she actually went to high school with Priscilla Presley. Uh, not Elvis, importantly, but uh, with, with Priscilla. Uh, Susan, uh, at the time, was... Bureau Chief for United Press International in Memphis, and uh, she is, and she uh, worked in journalism for about 25 years, and she is now uh, Senior Vice President in charge of uh, exhibits at uh, the Freedom Forum, which is, uh, and the museum, which is 
kind of our, um, uh, our are you talking about gurus or whatever. Anyway, there are benefactors here at the Overby Center. So we're glad to get Susan back down here. She's uh, been to Oxford several times. And I have to, uh, uh, have to say that Susan's husband, John Bennett, is here. And John is uh, an old commercial appeal reporter himself. So, John, we're glad to get you here to Oxford for the first time. Uh, on my far left is uh, Angus McCarran, another uh, Memphis man who was Metro editor of the Commercial Appeal on that fateful day in 1977. Uh, he oversaw the coverage uh, of the death of uh, Elvis Presley, and he went on to become editor and president of uh, the Commercial Appeal. He's the only uh, Memphis guy that's ever been editor of the, the great paper in Memphis. So uh, that's a, a distinction. Um, uh, Angus uh, had a thirty had a forty three year career in journalism before he retired, and in the middle uh, is my pal Bill Rose, who is now a visiting professor with the Meek School of Journalism at Ole Miss. Uh, Bill is originally from Shelby, Mississippi. <laughs> And um, his career really got started with uh, the Delta Democrat Times in Greenville, but was largely he's largely known for the 25-year career he had at the Miami Herald, where he covered the South for them, and of course he too covered the death of Elvis. So we're delighted to have you guys here. And Bill, I'm just going to turn it over to you, and let's hear you guys talk, tell some tales for us. Well, I'd, I'd like to start with, um, with something that happened uh, before I even got to Memphis. Um, I just had a small taste of the coverage of the death. Gene Miller uh, was the big writer for the Herald. I came later and covered the trial of Dr. Nicopolis, which was almost as much fun. <laughs> but uh, when, when I found out Elvis was dead, I was playing golf, and we made the turn, and we walked into the clubhouse, and the very large and elderly woman who served all the little kids at the swimming pool and the golfers on the golf course, uh, soft drinks and ice cream and sandwiches and the like, uh, always very shy and very quiet, uh, surly in fact sometimes, uh, she, uh, she was just, she was lying on the floor and she was crying, she was weeping, she was beside herself. And one of the golfers uh, uh, from Shelby, Mr. Mr. Wilson, went over and grabbed her and said, what's wrong? What's happened? What's going on? And she finally wailed after about a couple of minutes that Elvis had died. And uh, her life was over. Uh, I think before the day was over, they had to take her home and take her down to the little clinic there and get her some medical attention for a high blood pressure. This was her, her, her life was over because this event had happened. Um, and it makes me wonder what it was like uh, over at the Commercial Appeal, Angus, when, uh, when the story broke. How did it break? How did you all find out about it? And then what happened? What, did the, what was life like at the CA that day? Well, we got a Shirley Downing, who was a, a beat reporter. Uh, I'm sitting on the desk, and I'm scratching my head because uh, we don't have a damn bit of news. We're in the dog days of summer, and I'm trying to figure out how we're going to fill the newspaper. And Downing says, Angus, Elvis dead call on line two. And I said, for God's sakes, why do I need to take it? Now, you have to understand that over the years, we've gotten hundreds of calls saying, Elvis was dead, or Elvis was dying, or Elvis was coming back alive, or uh, he had been killed in an automobile, or he had been killed in a plane crash. He once was killed on a roller coaster, which made more sense because Elvis loved roller coasters. But I said, why do I want to talk to this guy? She said, just listen to his story. So I wasn't real polite that day. I was a little grumpy. And I said, what? He said, what, what? I said, what do you want? And he said, I don't want anything. 
He said, I call that lady reporter, and she said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, well, let's talk. And he said, well, I'm a win Arkansas ambulance driver, and I just delivered a patient to Baptist Hospital in the emergency room. And he said, the, uh, they just brought in, the fire department ambulance just brought in this big old fat guy, and they said it was Elvis, and I think he's dead. And I said, well, what makes you think it was Elvis? And he said, because the ambulance driver told me. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. So I called Toll Downing. I said, well, we got to make a few calls. And, I, you know, this is before you Twitter and, and do everything else. In those days, you actually check things out before you put them on the air or in a newspaper or whatever. So I said, well, call call the fire department and call Graceland, that fire station near Graceland. And meanwhile, I'll make a few calls myself. So I called my source at Baptist Hospital. And I have to tell you, in all of this, uh, we'll talk about it later, but the most clear thing about journalism was know your sources, work your sources, and you're only as good as your sources. And I call this woman who had been very helpful to me in the past. The hospital always denied when Elvis was in Baptist Hospital, and that was his hospital of choice. And he was in there for various ailments, but mainly because he's constipated. Um, and uh, I called, and she was off for the day. Well being a good source, a source worker. I had her home phone number, and I called her. I said, hey, to bother you, but I got another damn Elvis is dead story call. I mean, this sounds like something we got to check out. She said, okay, I'll call you back. So this is mm, 2 o'clock, no, no, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, she calls back within 10 minutes and said, well, Scoop, as usual, you got it about half right. And I said, well, what was right? She said, well, <clears throat> he's not. He was in the emergency room, but he's no longer there. And I said, you, you released him? She said, no, he's in the morgue. And she said it just like that. <laughs> and I said, oh, he's dead? She said, Barry. And I said, well, gosh, thank you. And she said, hey, Scoop, one more thing before you hang up. So what? Find out why they pumped his stomach out after he was dead. It'll be very interesting. And so we had Elvis, the hospital, and the medical examiner, Dr. Francisco, didn't announce Elvis was dead until 5 o'clock. So we had about a three-hour jump on the story. And a lot of what we did was going to sources and people who remembered and, and whatever. But it was, it was a pretty hectic moment. Uh, but again, going back to working your sources, uh, we were the only newspaper in the world they had a ringside seat to Elvis's funeral. The press was excluded. Uh, everybody was banned. And we have this wonderful reporter, writer, Bill Thomas, who just died last year. Uh, just an incredible writer. And I called him up to the city desk and I said, Bill, you're going to Elvis's funeral tomorrow. Wear a blue suit. He just, he says, I don't have a blue suit. And I said, Well, I'll buy you a damn blue suit. <laughs> and with that, he, <laughs> I can't talk too much more about it other than he was a, a member of the funeral uh, party. Uh, he helped put Elvis in the mausoleum and, in fact, uh, almost got sealed in the mausoleum because <laughs> they came in and, and bricked it up. 
uh, wrote an incredible, incredible story. But again, it was because I had, we had sources that helped us with that story. Uh, I think the media, and I'll shut up, uh, I think all of us underestimated, as, as Charles said, the incredible uh, drawing power and the, the affection of Elvis. I mean, in Memphis, we pretty much left him alone. He was a, a very private. He was nocturnal. Uh, he didn't venture out except at night, and if he went... He loved amusement parks, and he would just rent the amusement park for his friends. Or if he wanted to go to a movie, he rented the theater at midnight. Uh, if he went Christmas shopping, which he did, and you, you all know about his buying Cadillacs for his friends, they kept the place open so he could go down at midnight and buy these cars. So you know, he really wasn't high on our radar list. Plus the fact, you know, this was way before the, uh, this media paparazzi thing. I mean, as far as I knew, paparazzi was an Italian dish. Uh, it wasn't something people ran around reporting every nuance. I mean, you know, we respected his privacy. Plus, he was very private, and he didn't show himself. The most famous picture uh, that I remember was a picture of Elvis on a motorcycle. You probably remember. He's got his sunglasses up over his head. He's got on a leather jacket, and he's on his motorcycle, and he's got his foot there, and he's leaning into the camera, and he's got that great smile. Uh, that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't something they tipped us to. That's because our photographer was riding down Union Avenue and saw Elvis at the, at the red light and said, hey, Elvis, and he smiled, and that's how we got the picture. And that's pretty much how we covered it. What was it like in, uh, in Memphis right after he died in the several days leading up to the funeral? Was well, the, the sad thing is, Bill, I don't know what it was like in Memphis right after he died because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I had been working for UPI, and... Uh, as was often the case with wire service reporters, I hadn't had a vacation in 18 months. So I picked August 16th to go to Nashville and thought I'd get a little mini vacation. And I had just been up there for a few hours when I got a phone call. And this was from my boss in Nashville, who's a really calm guy. His name's Duran Cheek. And he has a bit of a Tennessee drawl. And he said, Susan, do you by any chance know where the obit is for Elvis Presley? because the wire services, as do newspapers, write in advance obituaries for people who they think might die one day and might matter. And I said calmly, well, yeah, it's in the New York computer. It's 10,000 words long, and it's in New York. And Duran said, well, not anymore. They had erased it by mistake. And he said, now, don't get upset or anything, because we also used to get reports all the time that Elvis was dead, dying, or uh, thinking about dying. <laughs> and he said, uh, we've got, there's a possibility, a possibility that Elvis might be dead. So why don't you just check the plane schedules? Because I had driven from Memphis up to Nashville. And I'll call you back. And I said, okay, fine. I checked there was a plane leaving in about an hour and a half. And three minutes later, he called back, almost screaming, get on the plane, get on the plane. <laughs> and so I threw all my clothes in a suitcase, and I ran out of the hotel. And I've always wanted to do this. I think I could only get away with it in Nashville, because I, as I went past the startled desk clerks, I said, Elvis is dead. I'll pay you later. <laughs> and they let me go. <laughs> uh, we did pay him later. But... Um, jumped in a cab, went to the airport, and the planes were all delayed because there was a terrible storm in Nashville. And I got on a plane that was just, we took off with tornado warnings that night. And as I was flying to Memphis, I was thinking, this is, what an irony, because they, my mother probably won't be able to find my obit in the paper if this plane crashes because of Elvis. <laughs> but we landed, and once again, I got to say something I always wanted to say. I got in the cab, and I said, get me to the Press Seminar Commercial Appeal Building, which is where our offices were. I don't care how many lights you have to run, how many tickets you get, I'll pay them all. And so um, 
what it was happening in our office was that we did not have Elvis sources. Uh, most of the time when you work for the wire services, you're sitting around doing the most menial of jobs. You're filing hog markets in the Mississippi River stages at mid-morning, the spot cotton report in Memphis, and you're sitting around waiting for something to happen like Elvis dying. Uh, but that doesn't mean necessarily that you have sources. So we had a real problem. The Associated Press, which had offices with the commercial, with the press, you know, the commercial appeal, um, Angus was so nice to the commercial appeal to the Associated Press. They they told them for a fact that it was true that Elvis was dead. But we were trying to call people, and because it wasn't a crime, the police wouldn't confirm it. They said we we can't tell you that, and we were calling the house Graceland, but the line was busy. So the people who worked for me were frantic because. The Associated Press had put a bulletin out saying Elvis was dead, and we had nothing. And in wire service time, minutes are just disastrous, and we couldn't match their bulletin. And finally, a woman who worked for me called the police chief and said, if you can't tell me I'm right with this story, I'm going to lose my job in the next five minutes. This was Nancy Albritton. And they finally said, okay, it's correct. So we match the AP story to get the bulletin out. But by the time I got to Memphis, there was no one in our bureau because somebody had to go to Graceland and somebody had to go to the hospital and we only had two people there. And I walked in, we had four telephones and they were all ringing, all of them. And I would pick one up and it would be a radio station in Hawaii. I'd pick another one up, it would be our desk in New York screaming at me. And I finally hired somebody from the press Cemeter library, a kid in there, and I said, just answer the telephones. And um, the desk in Atlanta finally got through to me, and they said, we'll take care of the main story. You know, we're getting reports from everything, but we need 10 additional stories, because they knew right away that newspapers weren't going to carry one Elvis story. They were going to fill up the front pages. They were going to do special sections. They were going to do extra runs. So they needed everything we possibly could have. What they didn't know was that our Elvis file was this big old file cabinet, and it was just stuffed with file folders, and nothing was in any order whatsoever. So I just got, they said, we don't care about grammar. We don't care about the, you know, the flow of the story. Just get this information to us, and we'll clean it up. So I got down on the floor of this tacky old building, because we were in an old Model T factory that was just looked like something on a front page. And I got down on the floor, and I just started going, help, wealth cars, drugs, girls, and I started making stacks of story ideas, and then I just started typing as fast as I could. And meanwhile, the four phones are still ringing, and uh, I s kept doing that, and we kept, we st of course, started flying people in, and the other issue in Memphis that time was there was a Shriners convention there, and there were a couple of other smaller conventions, so there were no hotel rooms anywhere for anybody. And I, I finally realized we had seven photographers who were flying in. And I just said, here, here are the keys to my house. Just I'll call my neighbors and tell them, don't worry that there are strange men going in and out of my house all night because <laughs> you, you take over the house. And um, I slept in the women's room, which was not as nice as most <laughs> ladies' rooms these days. There was a little couch in there. And that was how we got started. Wow. <laughs> Sam Phillips was... Uh from Memphis was famously quoted that uh, Elvis was uh, uh, more famous than Jesus Christ, or just as famous as Jesus Christ and more influential. Uh, why the heck, I don't know if Sam was accurate about that, uh, but why the heck was Elvis uh, so popular? Why did his death strike so many people so hard? What is it about the Elvis Presley you speak that still endures? Today? Yeah, well, why they still come on the anniversary of Elvis's death by the thousands. Uh, and these are people who weren't even born when Elvis died. I mean, their grandmothers and mothers and their granddaughters who come. And not only just female, but I mean, uh, people. I, I still don't understand the phenomenon. Uh, you talk about... Susan talked about the phone ringing. One of my side duties was be the arbitrator of what pictures we would release for wire services and other publications. And it was driving me crazy. We were getting calls from Paris, uh, London, 
London especially because they have huge Elvis base that we never anticipated. Uh, but we were getting calls from Africa, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and they'd say, we are desperate for photos of, of Elvis. And I said, well, you don't understand. We're in the process of putting this story together. Whatever you want, we'll pay. I said, okay, $2,000 a picture. Fine. Send it to us. Okay. So the next one, oh, here's $3,000. And so it was a tidy little sum by the time the day was over. Uh, but I didn't understand and still don't to this day. Um, Growing up in Memphis, we didn't have an appreciation for him, no, I don't no. think, because he was just one of us. I mean, there were so many other entertainers in Memphis. Um, Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis, and, but also all the blues guys and uh, the rock and roll people. So he was just one of them. And also, I think that's one of the reasons he probably lived in Memphis, is we left him alone. He, there was not the paparazzi, right. as Angus was saying. He could come and go as he wanted. When he wanted to go ride a roller coaster, he just rented the amusement park late at night. But I came to understand his appeal, because I had to go out to Graceland every anniversary of his death, every birthday. And I talked to so many people, and I think it was on so many different levels. I mean, there are the people that just really responded to the incredible talent that he had that I came to appreciate later. What a voice, uh, what a stage presence, what uh, a charismatic performer he was. And there are others who just love his story. I mean, he was born dirt poor, literally, and was able to become this superstar. And I think also it was a very careful manipulation of his career by Colonel Tom Parker. Turn. Colonel Parker. Because he was so careful in making sure that Elvis was not overexposed in the media early on in his career, that he didn't um, do those Oprah interviews and 60-minute interviews that can get you in so much trouble. They didn't have those shows then, but they had a lot of others. He uh, very carefully crafted his image by having him go into the Army and uh, everything that was done. So there was uh, a mystique about him. and. I think he was uh, the product and part of Colonel Tom Parker's manicuring. I agree. Yeah, Colonel Parker, uh, Elvis, Elvis respected him and followed him and did everything he said. And whenever his career would flag, Colonel Parker would come up with a new idea and Elvis would latch on to it and off they'd go. In the end, it probably helped contribute to his death because it was Colonel Parker who said, okay, you've got to go to Vegas now. You need to go to Vegas, and in Vegas, uh, he would hold these explosive performances where he'd go on at 10 p.m., and then he'd go on again an hour and a half after that concert, he'd put on another one. These were very exhausting uh, concerts. The man was already uh, uh, taking way too many drugs. And so hypertensive. He had, he had, right, he had hypertension, bad blood pressure, and he increased his drug intake as a result. That probably directly led to his death. Uh, it, it makes me wonder when I think about the furor at the time when he died, what would it be like uh, in the media if he died in today's crazy world of new media? I shudder to think. <laughs> um. It would be a lot, you know, it would be a lot more, but it was pretty amazing then. You know, when you think about, it had never happened before where an entertainer dies and all of a sudden, three, four hundred reporters, photographers, come into a city to cover it. I think a lot, I don't know what you thought, Angus, but I always dreamed about, this was, this was my great fear as the bureau chief in Memphis. There were only two really big stories that could happen there. It would either be a plane crash or it would be Elvis dying. And, uh, you know, he, he did do that, but I sort of envisioned it as a one-day story. I thought you'd cover the death of Elvis and then they'd take him to Tupelo and they'd bury him. I, it was only when I saw that this was going to go on for days that, and that newspapers would just keep writing and writing about it uh, that I began to understand the appeal that the guy had, the universal appeal. And also, um, you know, now it would have been much more instantaneous. As Angus was saying, I think also the, the facts would have not been necessarily reported once they were verified. I think just anything that was said would be reported. It probably would have come out sooner about his drug use yeah. and about the, what the circumstances that led to his death because 
that that took a long time to get out. About a year. It did. I mean, I was. I remember being at the um, press conference that the medical examiner had, and a, he was asked over and over again, "Wait a minute! You say there are all these prescription drugs in his body, but those in no way contributed to the cardiac event that caused his death." And he said, "Absolutely not. Absolutely not." And you know, what do you do? The the medical examiner is saying that. Yeah, the medical examiner, Jerry Francisco decided early on that the circumstances surrounding Elvis's death were not in the public domain, that that was a family issue. And he believed that firmly. And his initial report said Elvis died of cardiac arrhythmia. You know what that means? Your heart stops. Well, I don't know anybody dies if their heart doesn't stop. And that was the extent of, of his information. The truth is, Elvis died sitting on the toilet and keeled over and on the floor and was dead before he hit the floor. Again, because of the drug and the constipation and all these things that went with the drug. I think what we saw, we've seen with the movie stars, um, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, what was her name? Judy, Judy Garland. Garland. Uh, all the drugs they gave her to uh, keep her weight down and all that. I mean, we saw this with Elvis. I mean, this was criminal, what they were doing to keep him on the road. And, and your point about the, uh, Las Vegas is right on target. I mean, they, they pumped him up to do these performances, and then they pumped him down to get him some sleep. And in between, they were pumping him full of diet pills, diuretics, uh, everything to get him into those jumpsuits, which were increasingly, as you say, getting bigger and bigger. I, I think we forget, too, there was an early attempt by either his family or the, the larger family that was around him to control the reports about how he died. Because initially, they said that his body was found in the bedroom by his business manager. And that's what we wrote. Oh, Joe Espedito. Joe is, Espedito. Is, uh, tour Right. Tour director, yeah. And that's what the first story said. Um, we have those in, in our stories, in the wire stories, because we were going out, we, obviously we were putting our stories out before the commercial appeal came out on the street. And then they said, well, actually he was found in an ante room. Well, then it became a bathroom. And we were still typing this stuff, and we got a call in the UPI Bureau, and this woman said, you've got the story all wrong. And as Angus said, we get a lot of those kind of nutso stories talking, but, and they always gave them to me. And I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, what are you talking about? And she said, well, he wasn't found by Tony. He was found by my daughter. She was sleeping with Elvis last night. And I thought, well, now what mother would call and say that? <laughs> and as it turns out, Ginger Alden's mother would do that. <laughs> and Ginger Alden called and offered to sell us her story for $30,000. What a family. <laughs> what a, nice folks. <laughs> So we dutifully corrected our mistake and made sure that everybody knew that her daughter was sleeping with Elvis and that she had... He found him. She, yes. she and she did find him, yeah. She did. That took a year for the, the drugs thing to surface. To finally surface. come... The fi there have been some hints, mm -hmm. but the, the report that fell in my lap... Tell about uh, it. Well, as I said, uh, this source uh, called me in Birmingham and said, you need to come up this weekend, I need to talk to you. And the, the report was there, it was like 34 pages. And she just went to the bathroom and I photocopied it and there <laughs> we went. <laughs> um, but it was, um, the whole thing, <laughs> Charles and I were talking earlier about how we underestimated. I went to the, to the managing editor on Elvis, Tuesday or Wednesday? You remember? Wednesday? Okay. I went to him on Friday and I said, this story is not give, going away. I said, we need to put out a Sunday special section. And he said, why do you think that? And I said, because the Louisville Courier Journal is putting out one, for God's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> and I don't know of any connection with Elvis in Louisville. So we kicked it around. He said, well, how, 
what kind of press run are you talking about? I said, hell, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert on that. He said, 30,000? I said, seems like a lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> By the time we reprinted that section <laughs> in a month or two months later, it was over a million. And we ain't had sold a million of anything <laughs> at one time. I mean, it's just, it was mind-boggling. In fact, we were so embarrassed about how much money we made on it, we gave, I forgot what charity we gave a lot of it to. Not all of it. I mean, we were Scripps Howard. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that was the thing. The story just kept going on and on. I remember just wouldn't die. The, the day. Well, it still night, won't die. That's right. The night before. The next day was to be the funeral, and so our kind bosses said, why don't you go home and get some sleep? Now, they told me that at 1 o'clock in the morning, so I, of course, didn't go right to sleep, and I got a call about 4 o'clock that morning. I'd been asleep for a couple hours, and it was my desk in Atlanta, and they said, something terrible has happened at Graceland. Oh, yeah. And I said, well, yeah, I know that, and they said, no, 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 there's a guy, and he ran into this crowd, and he's killed people, and... It could become a racial thing, and nobody can find out what's going on, and they almost hit our reporter down there. you got to go, go to the Bureau. I remember driving down Union Avenue about 95 miles an hour to get there, and we just, you didn't know what was going to happen as a result of that. There were a couple people killed. Um, Hit-and-run driver drove in. It was, a, again, this outpouring. Out of nowhere came these thousands of people conducting a midnight vigil in front of Graceland. And they're standing out there, and this guy comes through and, and killed two and critically injured another one. And we're dealing with that on top of trying to get the Elvis story to bed. I mean, just it never ended for, for a long time. I remember when I, I wrote my boss in, in New York because I was very perturbed. I was an exempt employee. I had two union employees working for me, so that meant only that I got no overtime. Right. <laughs> I said, I worked 67 of the last 72 hours. You know, I really think I should get something for this. And he, months later, s said, I, you know, that was a pretty cheeky letter, but you're right. I'm going to give you a $5 a week raise. <laughs> I said, wow. Uh, <laughs> they were on the best script tower, too. <laughs> there you go. It was interesting, uh, after the autopsy came out and people began to dig into the drugs, uh, 2020 came to town and did right. their big program. And, Geraldo uh, Rivera. Yeah. Geraldo came to town. Oh, gosh. And uh, <laughs> um, w when I came to cover the trial, the first several days of the trial were spent uh, by the prosecution basically tearing down Elvis. Uh, they were describing his physical state as this fat tub of lard, you know, so bloated that uh, he could hardly walk and uh, he could never sleep and he'd wake up in the middle of the night and people would have to grab drugs from him and uh, they'd have to bring him a glass of water. He couldn't do it himself. Uh, there were stories from Dr. Nicopolis that he would go for weeks and weeks without having a, a, pardon me, without having a serious bowel movement. Right. Uh, so he was, he was in really bad shape, and, and they were blaming it all on Dr. Nick. And the numbers they had were staggering. Uh, Nicopolis had prescribed Elvis between 1975 and 1977 with 19,000 doses of, of drugs. Uppers, downers, you know, amphetamines, uh, tranquilizers, uh, Dilaudid, Demerol, uh, Tilopal, a whole bunch of drugs that, uh, some of them that you normally give to terminally ill cancer patients. And he would, uh, he would down staggering amounts a day, you know, 20, 30 pills a day. Uh, and Nicopolis was a fortunate man at that point because several doctors from Memphis came to the trial and the, the, still feeding off that Elvis Mystique, our local hero. And they testified that what Nicopolis was doing was a reasonable thing to do with a man who was already addicted to these drugs when he started treating him. He was trying to uh, build up his confidence in, in me, Nicopolis, and, uh, and then he was going to slowly wean him off the drugs. The problem was he never weaned. 
Uh, and the, the day before Elvis died, testimony was that he received the largest single dose of pills that he had ever received. That was the day before he died. Um, they kept trotting this stuff out and building it up, and it just looked like, boy, you know, this, this Dr. Nick, you know, they're just going to, they're just going to kill him. And the truth is, Dr. Nick, whom we call Dr. Narc, was a sleaze bag. Uh, he not only was prescribing these drugs for Elvis, but he was making an incredible income for people, women, going to him for uh, diet pills who were anorexic. And all you had to do was make an appointment, and he would write these prescriptions. I mean, he was, he was a pill dispenser of, of the worst order. And how he... Uh, continued for years to elude uh, losing his license is still beyond me. It's a, that's that, to me, the medical thing of we take care of our own. I mean, we just don't rat them out. I was amazed at the medical examiner, the licensing board, hearing for him because people, one after the other, these anorexic women, they would weigh 90 pounds and say he'd been giving them diet pills for over two years. One guy came up and he was given an enormous number of quaaludes. And they said, well, why would Dr. Nicopolis give you these quaaludes? And he said, well, because I asked for them. And they right. said, but why would you ask for quaaludes? And he looked at the doctors, he said, because ludes are good drugs. Ludes, <laughs> they'd be good. <laughs> and he still got off the first yeah. hearing. And these people that showed up at the trial were amazing from all over the country, you know. They, they thought, ah, now we've got the man who really killed Elvis. Now we know what happened. And they would troop to the, to the building there in, in, in Memphis, and, and they'd pack the halls, and they'd pack the courtroom, and they'd listen, and they'd go, oh, oh. And they would, uh, then they would flock out to Graceland, and they would go take the tour, and they would bring little plastic spoons and dig out spoonfuls of earth from the yard and surreptitiously put it in their pocket take it home. They'd uh, pull the berries off the bushes. They'd stand in front of the eternal flame and, and were shocked to find that right next to it was a little plaque that said, uh, provided for by Dr. George Nicopolis and friends, which was kind of interesting. <laughs> um, at the courthouse itself, I ran into one woman who swore that she would talk to Elvis frequently and he was still alive, and he would appear to her from a pecan tree in Graceland. Uh, and her husband was with her, and they had come from Missouri, driven down to Missouri in his 16-wheeler, because Elvis had told her in some long-distance conversation that she needed to move to Memphis to be close to him. And so they were looking for an apartment, and they, then they were going to look for a house. And I talked to her husband after. I said, now, you know, your wife is not talking to Elvis. Big old guy with a big beard, tattoos all over him. He held his head down. He says, I know, but I love her. <laughs> and she loves Elvis. Talked to a woman, um, Beth Pesey, who, uh, who ran one of the little souvenir shops out across from Graceland. And she was at the trial every day. And, and I finally got Beth to talk. And Beth uh, described how she first saw Elvis. She had gone out to Graceland and just happened to be there when he and the guys were out on their motorcycles and they came back towards the house in their black vests and uh, the girls were all excited and he came pulling up in there and, and he had this, this tipperillo, she said, that was in his mouth and he looked at her and smiled and curled up his lip and said, God, baby, you got beautiful hair. And Beth said, from that moment on, I would love him and I will love him until the day I die. Before he could get through the gate, she ran up behind him and put her hands up under his vest. And uh, of course, he'd been sweaty from this motorcycle ride. And he says, that's all right, baby. And Beth went screaming away from the scene and, and ran to her friends and said, oh, God, I've got Elvis sweat. <laughs> this, it was a remarkable scene. It really was. And it went on for days after days. Well, it did. And you know, we forget that he um, was put in this mausoleum. But some good old boys tried to chip him out one night. Um, they were, I don't, no one ever really knew exactly what they had in mind, whether it was Ransom or uh, Madame Tussauds or whatever, but um, they did try to take the body out. And the cemetery, which at first had sort of embraced Elvis being there because his mom was there, really decided they couldn't afford 24-hour surveillance. So they had to uh, 
unbelievably, they had to get an exemption from Tennessee law because I know you may not believe this, but we can't bury people in our backyards there. <laughs> And so they had to get this exemption from state law so that he could be buried basically in the yard at Graceland. His wife Chandler was, a, was the mayor of Memphis, and they were dealing with him. And he didn't give a rat's you know what about Elvis. And he said, they ain't digging a gr hole in that place out at Graceland and burying that guy. He just too damn much trouble leaving where he is. <laughs> but they prevailed. <laughs> Talking about Dr. Nick Nark, uh, I read a story the other day that had similarities. There was, there was a guy named Michael Jackson. Anybody ever heard of him? Does this sound familiar? I mean, it just, it's replayed so many times. <laughs> These doctors just are part of the scene, and they're part of the fabric. And, and Nick loved all this stuff. He traveled with Elvis on the plane, and Elvis gave him a new Cadillac every a year or every other year. I mean, it was a very close relationship. And you know, from all I've heard, he truly loved Elvis. But he killed him, or he certainly helped kill him. The amazing thing is he was acquitted in the trial, yeah. in the criminal trial. I mean, he was not charged with murder. I believe the charge was over-prescribing drugs or recklessly prescribing drugs. It's some technical charge. And uh, uh, he got off largely because of the doctors who testified on his behalf and also significantly because of the work of James Neal, this uh, really hot shot lawyer he had from Nashville. Nashville, right? yeah. Uh, James Neal was this, uh, uh, this small, very erect, very exacting, methodical man. And uh, he, would, he would stand there and he would squeeze out his questions. You know, you'd think this was going to be a puffball of a question. Now, doctor, he'd say, and then bam, zip, you know, he'd fire a question. He was particularly effective in uh, impeaching prosecution witnesses. Uh, he, oh, he was in the Watergate hearings, too. He was a prosecutor. I mean, he, was, he, was a prosecutor. Right. Yeah, he was very good. That's right. He would, um, the prosecutor for uh, the state of Tennessee called in this local pharmacist. He found this pharmacist who filled a lot of these prescriptions. And he got him to come in and testify to some of these questionable prescriptions, thinking this is going to really impress the jury. And then Neil gets up there and gets the doctor to testify that, uh, well, often Dr. Nick would intercept drugs, uh, you know, that came in from other sources. And sometimes he would come and ask me to help him fix up placebos. And then he put Dr. Nick on to describe how he would take syringes and squeeze them into those capsules and suck the, uh, suck the medicine out of the capsule and then put saline solution in. Um, and Supposedly, they also uh, would, you know, when they were about ready to give him an injection, they would squirt it into the carpet and prick him like they were giving him a shot, but not really, not really give him the shot. But it didn't really matter because Dr. Nick had given him so many pills that Elvis hoarded them. I think they found three huge bottles of pills at the house, and he had pills uh, sewn into the fabric of the curtain in his bedroom. I didn't know. No. You know, it was just amazing. So, but Dr. Nick, Dr. Nick, uh, later on, they came back and, and the medical board would pull his license several years later right. because he kept prescribing the drugs to other people, like you said. It was, it was a habit. Yep. What do you think is, um, um, Dr. Nick's written a book now. He claims that uh, Elvis, has, Elvis died of constipation which is actually accurate. It's probably the first... Ex it's better than the cardiac uh, arrhythmia. <laughs> <laughs> um. He was a kind of a sad case because uh, he was such a lapdog around Elvis, and, and, uh, and yet the whole entourage depended on him. And he called these people night people and said they couldn't sleep because of these performances. And so he had to help them with his medications, as he put it, uh, kind of like they helped Michael Jackson.
there's probably a germ of truth in that. I mean, Elvis, well, there was. I mean, here's this guy from Tupelo who's all of a sudden, they're telling him he's got to stay up till 10 o'clock at night and then go on stage. And, you know, probably in the very first stages of it, he did need something to help him go to sleep in the morning. The problem was, over time, then you need something to help you get up. And then you need something to help get that energy going when you go out on stage. And it's the cycle that not just Elvis, but so many other entertainers find themselves in. Unfortunately, there are people such as Dr. Nikopoulos who facilitate that and don't regulate it and take them over the edge so that they end up like Elvis and Michael Jackson and, and many others. If we couldn't confirm through my source or others that Elvis was indeed in the hospital, we would just go down Madison Avenue and look up <laughs> and look at the uh, the windows, and if there was tinfoil all over the windows, we know Elvis is there because he's didn't want any light because he's going to be up all night and he's going to try to sleep all day. So that's how we we could pinpoint when he was there. It's an incredible story. Is it true that Dr. Nick uh, also served as a road manager for Jerry Lee Lewis? Early on, yeah. 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 It's amazing. And we know Jerry Lee never touched anything. No. No. Yeah. no. m and M's. What was the hardest thing about trying to cover the whole Elvis story? I think it was trying to sift the, the truth from the, the fiction uh, because so many people were calling in with other rumors, I mean, uh, throughout the whole story. And the most difficult thing was that you didn't really ha know who to believe because it, it wasn't a criminal act. The police weren't giving the, all of the truth. The family uh, and the business people surrounding Elvis were shaping the facts to their advantage. So it was really difficult to find out what was really going on. And, uh, I mean, we had the benefit at the wire services in that we could keep writing the story over and over again. I, was, I do have a, a couple of clips here. Uh, you know, unlike the newspapers that at some point have to go to press, we, uh, you know, we could just keep going on and on and show the story as it progressed there. There's the commercial appeal, which is <laughs> Angus's paper that gives you some sense of how many people came that last day. And Susan, you got to admit that you were able to keep cycling these stories because you were taking them out of the commercial appeal. Oh, please. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? No, actually, Angus, we wanted to take them out of the commercial appeal, but yeah. you guys gave them to AP first, so oh. we took them out of the press seminar. <laughs> but, um, well, we gave it to the one we trusted, I guess. <laughs> What was so ironic was that you were owned by Scripps Howard. We were owned by Scripps Howard. And, well, I will say, AP beat us. They killed us on the bulletin. That was the, we were always head-to-head -head competition, and everybody in New York, both at the Associated Press and UPI, paid attention to these things. Angus could have cared less, but um, they beat us terribly on the bulletin. And usually, with the wire so services, if you're, if you're the first on the story, most papers tend to stay with that wire service because a lot of newspapers have a choice, or they did back in those days, of which wire service to use. And the first time they'd see something coming over the wire, they'd just rip it off and they'd go with that. However, fortunately, AP thought it was not that big a story um, as it went on. And so we were the ones filing all these additional stories about his wealth and his generosity and his previous health problems. And so uh, th they kept what they called logs, and they would log what every newspaper around the country used. Did they use AP for this story or did they use UPI? And we had a killer log, is what New York called it. So we came back and we beat them, despite the fact that the commercial appeal didn't help us at all. But we, well, you could we, buy we it and, and just copy it out of there. And don't tell me that didn't happen. I can tell you stories verbatim. Come on, give me a break. Uh, uh, uh. And of course, my husband now works worked for the Commercial Appeal too. And he was a good one. He wouldn't give a UPI anything either. No. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, UPI no longer exists, so now most newspapers have only one wire service to choose from. That's too bad. It is too bad. The competition was what kept things going and kept things lively and creative and good. Was it sensitive writing about Elvis at the Commercial Appeal? 
considering all the fan love for him, the devotion? I mean, did that have to play into your editorial no. concerns? No, and as I said, until about two months before Elvis died, when this the, his Memphis Mafia, two of whom published this, uh, this story about Elvis out of control, uh, shooting TVs and all, uh, there really wasn't much to be sensitive about. As I said, he just kind of was there and just wasn't respected there. his privacy. And, you know, uh, when he rented the amusement park, you didn't get in there. I mean, it, was a, it wasn't a photo op. So, well, weren't you guys a little suspicious about the hospitalizations? I mean, I know it's easy to look back on things, but didn't you wonder why somebody that young had to go in the hospital? I know he always said it was stomach problems, but... Well, yeah, we, I mean, everybody suspected, but again, you know, I'm not an expert on constipation, and, and I don't know how many people are, so I wasn't going to write a dissertation on it. But uh, it may have been more than just that. Oh, no, been. well, it would, obviously we thought he had some problems, and especially, you know, whatever diet pills he was taking weren't working. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and I, I probably... The autopsy never reported, but it could well have been liver damage and some other things because he, he was getting really big around here. But it wasn't, no, I don't, I didn't feel like we had any constraints at all. Uh, I think what Susan said, the biggest obstacle we had was trying to separate the spin from the Elvis camp and, and Esposito and and Dr. Nark uh, from the from the real story, and I, I think it was a it was a relatively, despite its impact, relatively easy story to cover. Uh, I've only been involved in two, what I would say, mega stories: uh, Elvis being one, and the death of Martin Luther King in Memphis, the other, and the King assassination. Mm -hmm me had far more impact on the world, uh, was incredibly more difficult to try to cover because uh, our sources were essentially the federal government and, and uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, and there was no information. I mean, I went to London when James Earl Ray was arrested there, and my reporting was on what I observed and was able to get. I mean, Scotland Yard, <laughs> they could care less uh, who I was or talking to any media. It was an incredible story uh, to, to find out who James Earl Ray was. And, you know, he was three or four people. He had all these aliases and had acquired passports, uh, had gone to Lisbon, uh, to become a mercenary, and he'd come back to London. Uh, he'd gone to uh, Canada to get a, a Eric Stovall Gar a Gall a passport of a, a deceased person. There, I mean, it was we couldn't. I mean, how does this guy, who we went to East Alton, Illinois, when uh, he was arrested? That's where he was from, and he escaped from prison there. I mean, how does this guy who, you know, literally fell out of the getaway car one time in a holdup because he didn't close the door? Mm -hmm. and he turned the corner and he fell out. And that's how the police picked him up. I mean, <laughs> this guy is figuring out how to get passports in Canada and going to Lisbon and come back. I mean, I still don't understand to this day, and I've <laughs> devoted a lot of years still to covering that story. I still don't know what that story is. I think he did it. Don't get me wrong, but I think he had a lot of help. I think his brothers were involved. No question in my mind, they were involved. Well, maybe we still don't know what happened to Elvis either. Well, <laughs> you know, he he surfaces. He does. Often. He uh, does. It's amazing, and it's just like the story told about the uh, the woman uh, putting her hands on him. I mean, just. It's still that way. I mean, they still go out there to this day and pull berries or, mm -hmm. or 
I remember the picture, the picture we had uh, of the funeral. They put a lot of wreaths uh, outside the mausoleum, and you know people with throngs were just going up there and just Rattle. Take, grabbing flowers yeah. and souvenirs. But Graceland is one of the things I think that continue uh, to bring people to Elvis. I mean, unlike most stars where they, they may have a small home or something, this is an, an estate of sorts, perhaps not to everybody's taste, but Priscilla Presley has, and uh, by extension Lisa Marie, did a good job of going in there, securing it, and fixing it up a little bit, and making sure that it didn't get as ticky-tacky as it could have, and regulating very carefully his image, his recordings, the whole handling of his after-death experience. And so it's, it's sort of preserved him in glass. And they're very good at doing that. I mean... No question. Uh, when you have Circus Olay, Elvis, and uh, reviews... I, I, I'll never forget this one um, wonderful Japanese teacher I met at the gates of Graceland, because, again, I had to go out and interview every anniversary. And I said, you know, what do you, why are you here? And she said, well, I've been saving my money for four years, and I saved enough money for a tour of the United States because I'm an Elvis fan. And I said, well, what have you seen? And she said, well, we, we flew to Los Angeles, and we saw where he performed there, where he did his movies. And then we flew to Las Vegas, and we saw the stage where he did his shows. And we're here at Graceland, and we're going to Tupelo. And I said, well, are you seeing anything else of the United States? And she said, oh, no, no, this, this is it. And I said, well, you know, Grand Canyon, New York City. And she said, no. And I said, well, are you a little disappointed in this? And she said, no, I'm going to go back home and start saving up so I can do this tour all over again. And I thought, wow. <laughs> and she was a teacher. She was an educator. But that was the connection she had with his music. She thought he was just a superstar. Miami Herald uh, ran a story when I was still there about a woman in Fort Lauderdale who uh, fell in the shower and broke her shower door and almost bled to death uh, and it took her to the hospital and uh, her husband wanted to claim that she committed suicide and Harold thought that was puzzling. They would normally not write about something like that so they, they checked with the cops and the cops said, well, here's what happened. She was in the shower, and she claimed that she saw Elvis in the tiles of the shower. And uh, uh, he was talking to her and told her he was still alive. And she was so excited, she ran out to tell her husband and ran right through the shower door. <laughs> so Elvis is still affecting <laughs> the daily lives of people in bizarre ways. If you go to the Internet, like I did last night, and you start looking at the blogs, it is incredible how many blogs there are not just devoted to Elvis, but devoted to the death of Elvis, whether he died, what he died of, you know, arguing about it, uh, dissecting the books that are still being written, you know, still screaming at Dr. Nick over the Internet. Uh, they, they've gone so far as to suggest that the word uh, Aaron on his uh, tombstone was originally spelled wrong, Elvis Aaron Presley, and so that means that he was sending a message and he's really alive. And then there's his twin brother. Right. It's his twin brother. <laughs> I haven't met the twin yet. <laughs> there was a twin brother who died, died at birth. At least that's the story. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Elvis, of course, was very devoted to his mother and uh, never really, by all accounts, got over her death, became uh, much more insecure after she died than, uh, than he was before. And he was, he was pretty good and secure all his life anyway. So he was, you know, that, that also played a role. He also it. believed that he would be reincarnated with his mother. Mm, yes, he did. And he got even weirder in the last couple of years. I mean, that whole thing with Richard Nixon and he mm. wanted the FBI the credentials, I mean, Bizarre. Well, Charles mentioned the uh, museum exhibit. We have actually the coat that he wore. He decided uh, he had gotten in an argument uh, with his business manager about his expenses, and so he took off in a huff, and he decides while he's on the plane that he wants to go to Washington because he wants to join the war on drugs. Not prescription drugs, but just drugs. 
And so they, the limo goes by the White House, and he had handwritten a note, and he drops it off at the White House saying, I'd like to join the war on drugs. And so they go to the Hotel Washington, check in, and uh, he tells this guy, you stay here and listen for the phone. I'm going over to the FBI and see if J. Edgar Hoover will let me in. Well, J. Edgar knew all about Elvis, and he would not let him in. <laughs> <laughs> so Elvis goes back to the hotel, and lo and behold, the White House is called and said, yeah, come on over. So he puts on this velvet jacket and uh, a belt that's about that tall. He'd gotten it in Las Vegas for breaking attendance records. It's d diamond, emerald studded, uh, not your normal White House garb. But he goes over there and meets Nixon, and Nixon does a very serious photo op with him. And the National Archives tells us that that picture of Richard Nixon shaking Elvis's hand is one of the most requested photographs in the National Archives. But while he's over there, um, Nixon gives him some White House cufflinks. And Elvis, being from a good old boy from Tupelo, says, well, these are really nice, but my boys out here, could they have some too? <laughs> and so they go s digging in the drawers for some more, and they get tie tacks and cufflinks for the entourage. And Elvis said, well, Mr. President, they've got some girlfriends too. <laughs> so they, they had to get even more stuff. I'm sure it was a White House visit unlike any other before or since. When Elvis, um, for years, he wouldn't fly when he was making movies in, in Hollywood. And he had this incredible entourage. And they went in like seven Cadillacs across country. And that's when the rumors, you know, Elvis had been hit by a train and all that. But um, it was, gosh, I don't know, six or seven years into his famous years before he'd ever ever get on an airplane. The, the colonel being so controlling of Elvis and being a very, very uh, beyond strong influence on him and not being bashful, the colonel was a pretty strong character. I missed and I never got where was the colonel in this construction of essentially Very good question. He was pretty much out of it by that time. Yeah. And he, you know, they had been some serious falling out. Uh, the colonel took serious money from Elvis. I mean, like embezzled. I can't libel the dead, so I can tell you. I mean, there were some real, real shenanigans going. It was, it was more than just controlling. I mean, he was controlling the money. Um, and... By that time, he had enough, and, and he, he wasn't in good health either. So he was kind of getting out of it, yeah. Do you all remember the picture? I think it ran in the National Enquirer of Elvis in his casket. And I was a Cleveland Ole Miss fan. We went, you know, we heard it on the news, the TV news at 3, and we drove up to Memphis, and we were in that crowd but in the afternoon, of course. But um, the rumor was that Caroline Kennedy, Took the picture of Elvis in his casket. No. Well, I remember she did go. Um, she was um, a New York newspaper hired her as That's a stringer. Right. Yeah. And so she signed in, and they actually let her in ahead of the crowd because they let some of the press go in first. Uh, but then she missed her deadline. <laughs> you know, she wasn't used to it. So I think in the end she did a piece for Rolling Stone magazine, but she didn't take the picture. The National Enquirer paid somebody a lot of money for that. Do you and remember I the picture? I don't remember. Yeah. Oh, yes. We have a picture of it in our exhibit. No, I do not. Yeah, they, they sure did. They, you that, know, was, they, that cost big bucks. Yeah. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. probably. But somebody, I mean, they, that was the amazing thing that I, you were there. Did you get, were you able to get in? Oh, yeah, they had a medical center uh, set up a, a med tent there. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of This go. was that afternoon, and there were thousands of people. It was over 100,000. Yeah. Um, and it was just, I mean, it was just incredible. We saw jumped in the car, let's go to Well, apparently so did 100,000 other people. <laughs> that was the amazing thing, and as we were saying, about just the phone calls that 
London and Tokyo, and I'd answer the phone. They'd say, hi, you're live on Honolulu 495. <laughs> what, what's happening in Memphis? It was just the, the interest in every single thing that was going on. And so many people did get in their cars. They got on planes. People came from overseas to be there. Um, and the fact that you had a little gap between the death and the funeral, that allowed even more people to get there because the funeral didn't occur until Friday. Um, I'll never forget that night because we had just, we didn't have many people. We had about five or six reporters and seven photographers. And so we're all just not sleeping and not eating. And my assignment was to write the, the for the um, wire services, you'd write a story for the morning newspapers and then somebody else usually would write a story for the afternoon newspapers. And so I was writing what they called the main lead for the evening newspaper. And it was much longer than usually we had could only write about 300 words. This was like 1,500 to 2,000. They said, just write everything that's happened. And um, going back to the technological changes, we had computers, and they had screens that were about this big. And I was just about finished. My boss was just pacing behind me because New York was calling every five minutes. Where's the story? Where's the story? And just as I was getting ready to send it, the screen went blank. And back in those days, you didn't have the save function. And you didn't have a backup disk. And I, I just, I stood up and said a really bad word. Uh, <laughs> and I, I couldn't imagine what had happened. Well, the woman sitting next to me had accidentally kicked the plug out of the computer. And it was gone. And my, my boss, the one who didn't normally get excited, <laughs> called New York and said, uh, it's going to be a little while. And so I had to write the story all over again. <laughs> so that's a difference. Today, I would have just rebooted or, you know. It would have been so easy to redo the story. You got to remember that the technology, as Susan said, was so different. I mean, we were still in hot metal days. I mean, they were linotype operators setting these stories in in lead, and you, stories came out like this, and they scraped them and shaped them to the page and rolled the plate. I mean, it was took forever by today's standards. Uh, we were all looking for pay phones. Huh? We didn't. We were all looking for pay phones at Graceland oh, and yeah. Baptist yeah, Hospital. One of cell our phones or, or computers. One or. of our reporters paid somebody just to stand at a pay phone and not let anybody else use it, uh, which was common practice in those days. I suspect that a lot of details that didn't get reported um, in the early days of that case back then, with all the limitations that the press had on it would just jump right out today. If an Elvis Presley died today, you know, it would break on a blog, right? perhaps. Uh, it would... Uh, well, it might break whether he was dead or not. It no, might. No. It might. It probably would. Probably would. They might even have a picture of him in the casket before he died. But you'd also have people tweeting in about how they'd seen his entourage at a pharmacy loading up or how they had seen him stumbling, you know, as he went on stage or the fact, you know, you would have had so much more information so much more quickly. That's the good news. The bad news is you wouldn't know what was true and what wasn't. Exactly. Right. That's right. Exactly. And that's what's, that's where we are today. I mean, it's, you know, how do you separate it? There's just so much. You mean you don't believe everything in Wikipedia, Angus? <laughs> um, I believe uh, he assaulted those women. <laughs> but other than that, I don't believe much of anything. Now, you wouldn't have, Angus, you wouldn't have run the picture of Elvis in the casket even if you had it back then, would you? I don't know. <laughs> uh, call. You know uh, if it happened today, would you run it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I probably would have run it then. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I understand. There were a few that picked it up and ran it very small. Just a few. I, you know, I, I, as much as I was involved, I'd never recall seeing that picture. Well, you need to come to the museum, Angus, because well, we've got it right there. Huh? On the internet? Go to the internet, man. How do you we've, work we've also got the... Uh, Google it. Elvis, <laughs> Elvis in the casket. Just Google it. There was a newspaper that ran an autopsy photo of uh, James Earl Wright. Or no, no, it wasn't. It was... Um, Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm. It was the autopsy of Lee Harvey Oswald, which we also have in a drawer in the News History Gallery at the museum. Mm. It was the favorite drawer of um, the teenagers who came. 
I'm just trying to fathom how that picture came about. I mean, it had to have come from somebody at the funeral home allowing that picture to be made, or somebody at the funeral home made that picture and sold it because he was under, I mean, the body was under tight, tight security. Was the casket open at the yeah. public viewing? It was probably the funeral home. I would think so. Yeah. Okay. We've probably been going, yeah. Yeah, we're done. Right ahead. All right. Anybody else got any good tales, though? This is, it's been fascinating. I'd just like to sum up by saying I really do believe Elvis is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Confirm. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And.